Thank you so much for taking time to listen to today's message. We really hope it encourages you. And if you want to listen to more, check us out at faithfellowshipchurch.net. But for now, let's jump into today's message. When I lived in, in Texas with my, my mom and my dad, uh, we moved there when I was 12. We lived two blocks from a Lamborghini dealership, um, and I fell in love with Lamborghinis. And my friend and I would ride our bikes over there, and we'd see like Espadas and Isleros and Countach and all these cool Lamborghinis. And it was like, oh, these are so cool. And so uh, two blocks away from the car dealership. I mean, you know, we were there all the time, and it was really fun. Um, and it just inspired me. I was like, I want a mid-engine car when I get older. I just wanted one. So as I grew older, I saved money up, and I knew what I wanted, and I finally bought a mid-engine sports car, and I was super excited to go pick it up. And the day that I was going to get it, I called my dad, and I asked my dad if he wanted to go with me to pick up my brand-new car. Now, it wasn't new. It was used, but it was new for me, and it was a mid-engine sports car, and it's what I always wanted. And my dad, of course, was super excited, and he's like, yes. Now, my dad drove a Honda Accord, and before that, a Cadillac. And they were both automatics. And you have to understand that to preface where I'm going to go with my story. So as we are, we're going there and we're driving there and I'm super excited and I already test driven the car and I liked it. And I I called my dad. I was like, do you want to go with me? I picked him up at his house. We went with me. We were going to go pick up the car, which was in North Dallas. So we had some way to go. And it was on LBJ freeway, which is six lanes on both sides. So you have a 12 lane freeway. So, so we're going, we're going to go pick up the car and we get the car. And I asked my dad, I was like, Hey dad, do you want to drive the car home? Yes, of course, he said, right? He's like, yes, because when he was younger, he had a Mustang, and he's telling me all about the Mustang. And I remember, this whole, I remember this vividly for a reason you'll find out in a minute. I remember, and he's like, yes, because it's like my Mustang, which was a sports car. Well, a Mustang was a little different than, than what I was about to buy. But he's like, yes. So we get there, we make the exchange, we get in the car, and the, the, the center portion of the car was really narrow. And where your feet was, the wheel well had the, the front tire kind of caved in. So it was really narrow down there. And your feet all went kind of to the right side. So as he's sitting there, he's like, there's four pedals down here. And I'm like, yes, there are. Well, what is, what is, we go through the pedals and I explain to him again, accelerator, brake, clutch, dead rest. Four pedals. As he drives a Cadillac with two pedals and a Honda Accord with two pedals. We get in the car and my dad, and I was like, you're good. And he's like, oh yeah, I got this. I'm good. So we kind of drive around the parking lot for a little bit and he's good. And it has a turbo on it and it's behind your seat. So as you kick the turbo, it rinds up behind the passenger seat and just screams. And it sounded really, really nice. So we, we get on the freeway, my dad is driving and I should have noticed, you ever have like a warning sign when you're like, warning, warning. My dad is like four pedals. Why are there four pedals? I should have been like, maybe I should drive. We went around the parking lot a few times and I remember he stalled at once four pedals. Okay. I said, warning, like the warning gauge is going off in my head. It should have been. I should have listened, right? We get on the freeway and we're driving and he's like, you know, shifts in in gears and we're good and all that. And he's like, listen, it sounds like the cops are behind us. And he's like winding up like the scream of the little turbo. And it's like, and he's just driving and having fun. And we get up and all of a sudden traffic bottlenecks where six lanes turn into another freeway called 75 and it all bottlenecks and traffic comes to a stop. And I'm watching in slow motion as he's like flying and he can't stop because he's hitting the wrong pedal. He's hitting the clutch thinking it was the brake. And we're just like, and we go underneath another car that comes up onto my hood. And my dad wrecked my brand new car all along. I should have had a warning sign, right? Like trouble is coming. I should do something about this. I didn't get my car for another three weeks. That is the beginning of Isaiah chapter eight in a sense to me. Isaiah was driving a mid-engine Lamborghini Diablo. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 8. Read this for me here. Isaiah chapter 8, starting in verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, make a large signboard and clearly write this name on it. He's saying, make it clear to the people. Get a signboard and write this name on it. Mahal Shalal Hashbaz. Everybody say that. I was just messing with you. I was just going to see if you'd say it. That's good. There you go. Good job. There we go. We have our Hebrew names down for the day. Which means, Meher Shalal Hasbaz, which means to swiftly conquer and quickly take away. To swiftly conquer and quickly take away is what that name means. 
So God tells Isaiah, I want you to write on a signboard in verse 1. I want you to write this name on it and walk around with this name. And everybody's going to read that, and they will know what it means because it was their culture, and they're going to mean they're going to know it means to swiftly conquer and quickly take away. And then not long after that, Isaiah's wife gets pregnant. She gives birth to a son, and God says, hey, I want you to name your son Mahashalal Hashbaz, which again means to swiftly conquer and quickly take away. And then God tells Isaiah, before your son can say, Mama or Papa, the Assyrian army is going to invade the land and take everything away. He's giving a warning, like warning sign, (laughs) the crash, the impending doom is coming. Trouble is coming. Do you not see the warning sign? Warning, trouble is coming. He gives this warning to the people. The Assyrian army is going to invade and take everything away. And what do the people do as you continue to, to look at this? I think this, you know, you begin to, to look at his words as he is saying, trouble is coming. And then if you look in verse 9 and verse 10, just read these words with me. He's continuing to speak and to prophesy. And he says, huddle together, you nations, and be terrified. Listen, you distant lands, prepare for battle, but you're going to be crushed. Yes, you can prepare for battle if you want, but you will be crushed. Call your council of war, but they will be worthless Develop your strategies, but they will not succeed. Trouble is coming. You can do everything you want. Everything you want. The warning sign sometimes is there. This is not good news. He's telling them the Assyrian army is going to invade. This is not good news. Anybody ever get bad news? Like, my car is wrecked. Anybody ever get bad news? Like, you have cancer. Anybody ever get bad news like the principal is on the phone and wants to talk to you? More than likely bad news. Anybody ever get bad news like my wife and I, like more than likely you won't have children? Bad news. Anybody ever have really bad news that wrecks you one day and you're just like, life is going good? Or it seems like life is going good. Maybe you have warning signs, warning signs like something's coming up and then all of a sudden it hits. And you're like, I should have seen this coming. I should have seen this coming. Warning signs of bad news. This is the story of bad news. Our world is full of bad news. You open up your news feed on your phone. Man, you just scroll through your news feed. Bad news, right? School shooting again last week, right? Again in our country. Bad news. Our country is still at war in the Middle East. When is that going to end? Man, our, 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 our president right now, our country is, is in the process of possible impeachment. Bad news, right? There's bad news everywhere. There's a lot of bad news. And he is saying, Isaiah, I want you to give this bad news because there's a warning sign of something coming. Bad news. When bad news happens, and like in your personal life, what begins to happen if you get bad personal news? You begin to process something, and I do think that something happens as we begin to lose hope possibly sometimes, right? Anybody ever been there? Think about in your own personal life when bad news hits. Sometimes your hope begins to take a hit. The hope that you have that life is going to be good. The hope that one day we'll have children begins to take a hit. The hope that if we have cancer or, or whatever it is, or the hope that, you know, maybe I, 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 you lose a job, you get a call from the principal, whatever bad news is, what happens to us when bad news hits is hope possibly begins to take a hit. Proverbs tells it to us like this in chapter 13, verse 12, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. Has anybody ever felt that? I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, but think about that. Have you ever felt that before? You begin to lose hope and you feel it in your heart, right? Hope deferred makes the heart sick. You begin to lose hope. Man, when we get hopeless for something in life, it is never going to change. It's never going to get any better. What do I do with that? When bad news comes, it affects our heart. And what do we do? And I love the answer that I see next in verse 11. I love what God tells Isaiah to do and how he tells him to live. In this situation where he is living in a country that is surrounded by enemies, that is split into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, they have experienced civil war, if you will, in a sense. And now they are, God is saying, your country is going to be invaded. You're going to be taken away as captors. This is all really bad news to listen to if you are Isaiah. And yet in verse 11, I love what God tells Isaiah and what I believe he tells us today. I want you to look at the words with me in your scripture. I love it. 
in the New Living Translation. I don't know how it reads in the Bible that you might have in your hand. But verse 11, it says this. The Lord has given me a strong warning not to think like everyone else does. I love that. Man, church, that is good. God has given us a strong warning not to think like everyone else does. Amen? When bad news comes, how do we think like everyone else does? Nope. When news that there's, you know, change in the stock market, when news that there's um, stuff going on in life, should we think like everyone else does? I love that Isaiah says, and God gave me a strong warning not to think like everyone else does. And then you go on and read the rest of it. It is so good. He says, don't call everything a conspiracy like they do, and don't live in dread of what frightens them. What makes our world afraid? Man, you just have to begin to look at the news, and you see what makes our world afraid. Losing money. The economy makes the world afraid, doesn't it? Man, war makes the world afraid. Sickness and, and disease and infection, some of those things make our world afraid. And rightly so, I understand it. But God still says... Don't live like the world does. Don't think like the rest of the world. They get frightened by your things that you should not be frightened about. The only thing, church, that should move you is the voice of God. Not even your own voice. God's voice should be the greatest voice in our own lives. He goes on. He says this. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. That word holy again, I just had revelation when I understood it simply means set apart. Make God set apart. Make God number one. Make him the absolute in your life. He is the only one that you should fear. He is the one that should make you tremble. And he will keep you safe. He goes out with this warning to the people and he says, bad news is coming. Bad news is coming. Bad news is coming. We live in a world that is full of bad news, bad news, bad news. And yet God says, I'm giving you a strong warning. Don't think like the world does. Don't think like the world does. Don't be afraid of the things that make the world afraid. Instead, you put your attention on Jesus and he will keep you safe. That right there is good enough in itself. It is so good. He continues to prophesy and he speaks about the, the Assyrian invasion and what's going to take place. And he says that as you follow the scripture out, you begin to look in like verse 19. Talks about the invasion coming. Talks about the, the prophecy of, of bad news coming to their life. And he goes on in, 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 that, in that latter part of the chapter in verse 18, 19 through 22. And he says, some people say, well, let's consult mediums. Let's, let's go consult psychics. And he's like, why are you consulting the dead for what the living God can only tell you? And then he says this. People get hungry. If you read the scripture, it's good. Verse 20 through 22. He says, people get hungry. What are they hungry for? Are they talking about food right here? I don't think so. I think it's people that get hungry for hope. Have you ever been around people that are in a, a, a dire situation, but they have incredible hope? Man, I knew a woman at our church in California. She was amazing. She was, she was an older woman. And, and, and I think this, I believe that women are meant to bring beauty into our world. I love this. This is a side note for a second, but I, I, I love that you begin to look at every other culture. You begin to look at every ethnic group. You begin to look at every nation, every religion. Look around the entire world. You don't have to tell women to try to bring, to be beautiful. Women want to be beautiful. You look at men beyond culture, beyond ethnicity, uh, beyond every region in the world, and men typically don't really care if they're beautiful or not as much as women do. And so all the men are like, amen. Um, I, I love that God... Put that in men and women, the uniqueness I love. This, there was this woman in our, in our church. She was an older woman. She was easily in her 70s. She was so beautiful. And when she came into a room, the beauty that I think a woman brings is peace. I think a woman that is truly beautiful brings peace. You look at beautiful things, and they give you such peace. They make you feel a certain way. The mountains around here, I look at the mountains, and I'm like, oh, beautiful. You look at the water sometimes, and I'm like, oh, beautiful. How does beauty make you feel? You have a beautiful picture, a beautiful something that you like. Makes you feel a certain way, right? Beauty does something to us. Beauty is good. God created beautiful things. Beauty does something to us as people. I think a part of what beauty does is it brings peace. And she was an amazing woman. And when she got sick, I, I, I just the only way that I know how to say it, like her beauty and her hope in God was such at peace. She had bad news, but was at such peace. 
because she did what I believe the scripture does. And I think when you don't have that, there is a hunger inside of people that is not satisfied with anything else that only the hope of God can bring. So I love this. He says right here, verse 21, they will go from place to another place, weary and hungry. And because they are hungry, they will rage and curse their king and their God. They will look up to heaven and down to the earth. But wherever they look, there will be trouble and anguish and dark despair. They will be thrown out into the darkness. This is bad news. When we get bad news in life, a difficult situation sometimes. But you follow the sentence structure and he says this, nevertheless. I love that word. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. A place of dark despair, a place of hopelessness, a place of struggle. And he says, nevertheless. I love that. Nevertheless, verse 1 of chapter 9, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. He goes on, he says this, that people living in darkness have seen a great light. People living in darkness will see a great light. God is telling these people, you're going to experience a hard time. Life is going to be difficult. The Assyrians are going to invade your land and take you away quickly. He's giving them bad news. Warning sign, like when I had my dad drive my car. Warning sign, this should not be bad. There's four pedals. Yes, there are, dad. I hope this is a good decision. Warning sign, life is going to be difficult. What do we do in that moment? As he's giving them warning sign after warning sign, he's saying this. Don't think like the rest of the world. Put your attention on God, who is greater than the world. When you are overwhelmed by your troubles, be overwhelmed by Jesus. And he goes on, he says, nevertheless, this time of despair, this dark time in your life is not going to last forever. Because the people living in darkness will see a great light. If I was these people being surrounded by Assyrian invaders, I would be like, great, God's giving us a promise like we have hope. It's coming, right? I love that he refers, Isaiah refers, every time you read this in Scripture, when he refers to God, he says, the God of heaven's armies. I wonder if the people were like, God, send us an army of angels to defeat the enemies, right? That's what you're doing, right, Jesus? You're going to send us an army of angels. Wait, God, fire from heaven is going to fall down on on our troubled situation and contain our enemies, isn't it? That's what you're going to do, God? I'm going to send you a baby. I love that. I wonder what the people were thinking, what they were wanting when they had bad news. And they said, our solution would be this. Maybe their solution was God send us an army of angels. God send us fire from them down to heaven. But God says, my solution is I'm going to send you a child. And unto you, a son is going to be born. And the government will be on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And he goes on and look at the last sentence here. And I love this part. Verse 7, it ends like this. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. And this is my favorite part. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. Explanation mark. It could have said this. It could have said that the commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. And that would have been like, boom, enough for me. The commitment of God is going to make this happen. God is committed to making this happen. But I love how he adds the passionate commitment of the Lord is going to make this happen. That is good news. That is incredibly good news. And in a people living in a time of bad news, when they were surrounded by bad news, they had good news from God saying, I have a plan. My son is coming. I promise to take care of this. I am passionately committed to making this happen. I will fix the situation you are in. But my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. In our own life, isn't that true sometimes? Years ago for my birthday, my wife wrote on my wall and a part of our house that we have since remodeled. But I cut down the portion of the wall. She painted on the wall. She wrote on it and painted on our wall. And she wrote these words. 
She wasn't well at the time. She was really struggling with sickness, and I would come home, and she would slowly do it, and it was for my birthday. She wrote these words, do not forget in the dark what you have learned in the light. And I love that. And it was during the season when it was really dark for my wife, too, that she wrote those words. Do not forget in the dark what you have learned in the light. When we go through difficult times and hopelessness can sink in, we need to do what God told Isaiah, where he gave him a stern warning not to think like everybody else. Don't be moved by the things that make everybody else afraid. Be only moved by God who you should stand in awe of. He is greater. I remember taking those words and we cut the wall out when we remodeled that wall. I have it in my garage now. To always remember what we learned in the light and never forget those moments in the dark. Years ago, God spoke to my wife, and Pastor Joe mentioned this, this thought this morning that it is a, a word from God, a timely word from God that will always carry us. It was, it was years and years ago. I know we were living in Washington, but I think it was in the beginning of our time here, and we've been here about 13 years now that God told my wife that we would be so busy we would have no time for kids. And I really didn't know what that meant at the time, of course, but she's written this down. It's in a journal. Be so busy we'd have no time for kids. And when we got to the time in our, in our life when we realized we wouldn't have any biological kids and would go through the idea of the hysterectomy, that word carried us when it was just difficult. Mm -hmm. There are times that are, that are difficult that I feel hopeless that absolutely a word from God is what will carry you. And we need to hear a word from God. We need to hear a word from God. I think the word for today is what God told Isaiah chapter 8 verse 11. A strong warning not to think like everybody else does. To think how God calls us to think. Not to be moved by everything else when there is bad news all around, but to hold on to the great news that he is coming. Isaiah wrote these words about 600 years before Christ was born. Well, before 600 years before Christ was born. 600 years. And I love the, the story of Matthew, who was a tax collector, working for the Romans, collecting taxes at the time that Jesus was alive. When he was there, the people that these words were written to were living under the Roman Empire rule. They had lived under the, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire. God, when are you going to set us free? When is this bad news going to stop? And God says, I'm going to send a son, a child, Messiah. And as Matthew is collecting taxes at his tax collecting booth one day, Jesus walked past him, and I'm sure that Matthew had heard Jesus preach. But one day when Jesus walked past Matthew's place in life where he collected taxes for an empire that he probably did not enjoy. I wonder what Matthew's place in life was in that moment. And Jesus said, Matthew, I want you to follow me. Matthew followed Jesus. He watched Jesus feed over 5,000 people with a kid's sack lunch. He watched Jesus walk on water. He was there when Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead three days later. Matthew was there for it all. And years later, he chose to write to people in his own culture a little bit about their story. When you begin to think of like, how do I write a story? How would you begin? That's an important part. Anybody ever write a letter or a text? My goodness, how many times have we like backtracked on our words? Let me start this again. And we begin to think these first words are super important, right? Matthew chapter one, which I'm sure is everybody's favorite chapter in the book of Matthew. He begins to write and he says, how should I start my story of the good news that God has given us? I'm going to start by reminding the people that I'm writing to about their descendant, Abram. Because once they begin to read about Abram, they're going to remember that God made a covenant to a man named Abram. God made a promise that one day he would send Messiah. I'm going to remind them about David, one of our greatest kings that led our country 
I want to remind them about the time that we were exiled in Babylon, taken as captives. I'm going to remind them that one day an angel would show up to a young girl named Mary and speak in dreams to a young man named Joseph about a child that was to be born that would bring hope to hopelessness and a savior to the world. I want you to do this with me, church. If you can just put everything out of your hands and let me have you just stand with me. Isaiah's last words, I love that in chapter 9 where he says, the passionate commitment of the Lord will make this happen. My dad, when he wrecked my car, which we had driven for probably less than 30 minutes, and rear-ended the back of a Nissan that was now sitting on the hood of my car, went to State Farm, which was his insurance agency, and I had my State Farm insurance policy, and he had his. I didn't live at home at the time, but I had still my insurance policy with him. My dad went, and he asked the agent, can you in any way put this on my policy so it will not affect my son's policy? And they did that. They did that. He looked at my hopeless situation and he said, I want to fix this. I want to do this. The passionate commitment of my dad who went and spoke on my behalf. He said, I want to do this. I want to correct this. It speaks to me of the passionate commitment of God that pays, that corrects everything, that gives hope. I'm going to ask the elders and the prayer team, we're going to end with this. If you guys can make your way forward, we always want to be here to pray with you. Always, God said his house is a house of prayer. Jesus boldly declared my house is a house of prayer. If I can have the elders and the prayer team just quickly make your way up front real quickly. And everybody else, I'm just going to have you just close your eyes and just put your attention on Jesus for a minute. Sometimes we have that warning sign of trouble is coming. And then when trouble comes, sometimes we get overwhelmed by the fear. I believe that God's message for us today is exactly what he told Isaiah. Not to think like the world, to put our hope in the promise of Jesus. If you're in a place where you, it, lo- it looks hopeless, where it seems hopeless, it is good to take and pray with somebody and say, I'm putting my hope in Jesus. I'm not going to give my attention to hopelessness. I'm not going to be moved by the fear of what might happen. Jesus, I want to put my attention on you. If that's where you're at today, we want to pray with you. I just want to ask you just to make your way out of your seats and just come up. We just want to pray.